can't last two days without kissing me. Is that a challenge I right hear? I think you lost the challenge. Hey. Hey. Can I help you with that? Oh, thank uh. you. So, you're sure about keeping it low-key? Sorry guys, but you're basically incapable of being low-key. In fact, your key is so high it's practically floating. Yeah. Probably shouldn't sit next to each other on the coach. Quote from editor for episodes 2, 4, 6 and 7, Andoni Stratos. Kit and Joe can do so much with just their various looks. You can see the internal strife at times, and you can genuinely feel and care for them. As an editor, you become very attached to these characters and these actors. You just want things to be okay for them. But those two have such a range. There is a lightness and a joy to the time they spend together, and they just communicate all that really effortlessly. It could be fun being a secret again. Yeah. Charlie's overcorrecting so much. Neither of them wants to be that secretive and they both think they're doing what the other wants. At this point it's clear both of them would be most comfortable just being low-key but still close in public. I bet you can't last two days without kissing me. Quote from Joe Locke. I have always said that Charlie's got this quiet confidence to him. He knows what he wants from his life and he knows how to get those things. Whereas I feel like in season two in general, he's just more confident. He's more confident in himself. He's more confident in the person he loves. He's more confident in his friendships, which was really fun to play. Is that a challenge right here? Maybe. <laughs> yeah, I think they sort of, their, their relationships like, you know, starts to blossom and they get more comfortable with each other. I think one thing that you can expect in season two is that Nick and Charlie, it's a lot less sort of like cute, shy, um, you know, sort of awkwardness it's to it. Up. It's more yeah. like they're just more comfortable yeah. with each other. Yeah. Um, because in season one, they were just, you know, infatuated with one another, but they were also still very much, um, you know, nervous and, and, and sort of shy yeah. around each other. Uh, but yeah, in season two, there's much more just sort of, they're more comfortable with each other. They're, they're you know, a bit more silly with each other. <laughs> and, Silly, goofy, quirky, all that good stuff. <laughs> uh, and yeah, they just they just have a bit more fun, I think. Yeah. Hey. Hey. I'm so excited. Tao and Isaac were just conveniently not sat together, even though they got here first. What are you reading? Les Miserables by Victor Hugo is a pretty hefty brick of a classic to bring on a school trip to France. I can see why he picked it, though. Really going hard on the French theme. Do you want to sit next to Tom? No. I'm gonna sit with the girls. Whoopsies! Nick was so caught in his own drama that he wasn't briefed on the disaster date situation. Poor Nick getting punished left and right having to sit with his antisocial grump. Um, I'm sorry, but nowadays you have to have like a seven step skincare routine, so if I pack it too much, then it's a patriarchy, not myself. Nick's just like the rules of feminism. Can I? What was that? Beard was that? I don't know. Watch your own hair and life. Look, my lunch is just as good. Look at my dress. Look at my dress. Look at my Thank you, Mr. Farouk. Uh, right, is everyone ready to leave for Paris? Yeah! Woo! Yeah! Come on! <laughs> okay, let's have everybody making a noise. <laughs> I did not go to Paris as a school trip. Oh. Um, I did go to France once, I think, when I was 12 on a school trip, um, but 
it was to Poitiers, oh, okay. I think. And I'm not even sure where that is. <laughs> and I don't remember it that well. Um, but I have been to Paris a couple of times. Um, and I felt like that was a really fun place for yeah. the teens to go. Because it's kind of like... It's, it's a believable like British school trip, I think, because you're just kind of going across the channel. Mm -hmm. You're not getting on a plane. Um, and there's so much cool stuff to see. So, yeah, it was really fun. Quote from writer Alice Osman. When I originally created the comic, I chose Paris because it was a believable school trip location, easily travelable from the UK and lots of cultural landmarks. But thematically, it marks a step outside of the cozy, relatable world of Truem that we have come to know in season one. As the characters are growing up little by little, they are thrust into a big new world. Away from home and the prying eyes of parents, they're getting a first little taste of adulthood. And with that comes new experiences and a lot of drama. Quote from D.O.P. Simona Shushna. There are so many threads between the characters. Romantic couples, friendships, love interests. That translated into a lot of coverage, a lot of angles, a lot of shots to do within a time frame where being in a real coach was unrealistic. Before you and Nick got together. What was the point of not sitting with Nick if you're just going to talk about being with him out loud? How did you know that you liked him in that way? I just always wanted to be around him. But also, any time he was there, I felt like I couldn't breathe. And I literally could not stop thinking about kissing him. <laughs> Quote from costume designer Adam D. Toby's got some ideas about Isaac. Last year, he and Alice got together and thought about what his look could be. So we worked some of that in, and he quite likes to play around a bit and suggest some things. He wanted to do little caps with little flowers on them this year, so we managed to get a couple of those in for Paris. So, he, so the bus goes on the train. On the train, yeah. Oui. And do any of the cast speak French? Because I know that Nick does speak <laughs> Nick French. Nick does speak French. Does um, Kit speak French? No. <laughs> <laughs> he had to have lessons. Um, no one could speak French. So, not that I know of. So. <laughs> Charlie's drum has asked, do you know some French words? Because Nick is supposed to be fluent in French. So I, f I know a few. I know a few. Um, go on. Oui. Um, bibliothèque. Means library. Library, yeah. Um, French GCSE. That was off the that was off the cuff as well. Yeah, I did do French GCSE. No, I didn't even do French GCSE. Um, My favorite French word is pamplemousse, which is grapefruit. Pamplemousse. Yeah. Okay. That's um, a great word. Like I know, un, deux, trois, quatre, cinq, six, sept, huit, neuf, dix, onze, douze, treize, dix, quatre, dix, uh, something like that. Yeah. That's gonna, uh, so really, basically fluent, totally essentially. Right so he was apparently asked about French in his audition process, so he was prepared that he might have to do this if they got more seasons. Quote from Kit Connor. There wasn't that much French to speak in this season, but it was a lot for me. We had this French teacher who was really lovely, but also a bit scary. I think because I was so bad at French. We focused on trying to make me sound like I knew how to speak French as much as possible, just seeing how far we could go with that. One thing I'm really excited for, uh, for my character, is going to Paris because he's, he's French. Um, so that's going to be really exciting for him. He gets to see his dad. The second thing I'm really excited for my character to speak French because it's just going to be really offensive to French people. I made a separate five minute video about how the French dub handled Nick speaking French and all the other language dubbers struggling with all the French lines. Okay. Bye. What the hell was that? I love how in this moment Tao is everyone watching the show who didn't read the comics. My dad. Your dad's French? Yeah. He lives in Paris, so um, I'm gonna try and meet up. I don't really see him often. So. What? Oh, it's just unexpected. This is an interesting moment for Tao because he's been thinking of Nick as a very one-dimensional rugby lad stereotype and in this moment he finds out Nick has an absent father and is bilingual. In other words, he's similar to Tao in two ways that he wouldn't have expected. Yeah. Then why can't we see any fish? <laughs> In this moment he regretted all his life choices. Above all, not repeating this lecture at the start of the trip. 
No annoying questions. It's just pitch black. In the comic, we can't tell who actually said this. Of course it would be Darcy. Also, Nick and Charlie weren't separated. Apparently, this isn't even an unheard of thing for kids to think. I saw one person reacting to this episode say they thought the Eurotunnel would be like an aquarium, and there's this viral tweet. It's literally gonna be the best few days of our lives. We go to Paris and Tara's changed. She's like, braided. Um, that's a nice fun shock. Also, we're out of school uniforms, so there's so many fun looks. Um, I was literally obsessed with half of them. Yeah. <laughs> I guess I've just been worried about when I said you didn't say it back. You mean about our prom outfits? Because, you know, I still think we should be Princess Peach and Mario. Darcy, no! Due to fear of possible weather complications disrupting shooting on location, the bus scenes were shot in a volume, an LED immersive soundstage. The volume was a more controllable environment for shooting with over 50 teens as well as for safety and insurance reasons. Isaac's on the last page of his book just as they arrive. It's about a five hour trip from Kent to Paris. Ben, you are not making it hard for Imogen to clock your obsession. They also swapped seats. Quote from costume designer Adam D. Imogen is a bit of a chameleon throughout the show. Like during the rugby match, she wears a striped top to match Nick. Then when she's with Ben, she slightly matches his choices and jackets. But when she gets to Paris, she goes all out. She wants to dress her best and look great, and that's what she does. The actual hotel is called Hotel de Sivine. It's called Hotel Mignon on the show. Mignon means cute. Farouk and I will be in room 203 if you need us. But hopefully you won't. Wouldn't want students interrupting your private time together. I see, I see. I said we couldn't do it right now. Do you need a hand? No. Take a pick. Cute. Is that like Quote from composer Arieska Chase. I do have a Paris trip theme. It was actually quite a tricky track. The main goal for any cue is to make sure that piece of music ties into how everyone's feeling at the time. So it's that we're on a French trip, it's cool, it's exciting, it's full of energy. And I did want to put some French things in there without going too overboard. So I did put something in there, but I'm wondering if anybody will notice. I'll give a clue. It's a specific instrumentation that runs along and it's more prominent in certain sections, but it's got a lot of processing on it as well. It sounds a bit like a synth, but it's really something else. And that's all I'll say. I didn't want people to hear it and go, oh gosh, she's done something French because they're in France. Music from around the world is beautiful to explore, and if you're in a place, it's nice to feel that vibe. But I'm not going to pretend I'm a French composer. Oh, nice. Quote from articles, study up on 25 Heartstopper Season 2 Easter eggs and fun facts by Tara Bitch and Fortudum. The exteriors of the kids' French hotel were shot in Paris, but the interiors for the boys, girls, and teachers' rooms were built where the show films in Slough, England. The hotel's like a faded grunge feel of a hotel that was once wonderful, but has since had several rounds of new management after a refit in the 80s and the parts were changed in the 90s, said production designer Karis Beard. We're keeping it a believable space that the school trip has gone to, but still magical and romantic. You have to share beds. 
Well, I'm up in the window. I want the other bed. I hate being woken up by the sun. <sighs> Isaac is excused because he just called dibs first, but Tao. I guess I'll share with Tao, and you can share with Isaac. Yeah. Disappointed! Quote from article playing by the book by Helen Parkinson for British cinematographer. The Paris Hotel, of the biggest set, was built in the school's gym. Its modular design meant that with a few small adjustments to the walls, it was used for the boys' hotel room, the girls' room, with an additional build for the teachers' hotel room. Quote from DOP Simona Shushna. Some studios I inherited from season one, which was difficult because they were too small for the pace and amount of dialogue we had in season two with multiple characters. When we were looking at building the hotel set, I told the design team in advance of my height requirements and what necessities I have from a lighting point of view so I could actually rig the lights on the ceiling or outside the main windows. I thought you'd find it awkward sharing with Nick. Just standing next to her makes me feel like I'm being electrocuted. So in the comic, Tao says this because he still thinks Charlie has an unrequited crush on Nick, but in the show, Tao is just projecting his own feelings on Charlie, not thinking about how different their situations are, with Nick and Charlie already being in a proper relationship. It's perfectly in character for him to think this, but it is a bummer that Charlie doesn't feel like he can say that they wanted to share a bed. Bounce test! <laughs> One time Yaz accidentally need me in Oh, that was that was like a like oh it sounded bad that one. <laughs> yeah, no. I don't think it'll make three because it's actually quite that bad. Was dramatic. I was like, oh my god, like yeah. But <laughs> lots of funny moments. Even like when we were filming in the Paris room. Yeah. One time Yaz need me in the eye. We're doing a scene where we come into the room in front for yeah. the first time and we're like jumping around on the bed, we're really excited and Yaz just got up too fast and bashes me. No, I absolutely did not knee Kizzy in the face. Maybe I did it like by accident and Kizzy took it personal, but uh, shout out to you Kizzy, that was not intentional. <laughs> um, I think because sometimes as a group we're all just like so close to each other and everyone is like barging to like get on the camera and we're like, oh, I don't mean you. It's just like, it's a lot sometimes. So it's kind of like, yeah, sometimes there is an arm and a leg that is sort of swished around and maybe like knock somebody out on set and they've got to go to hospital and A&E. Hey, we're in Paris. They're being sad, come on. <laughs> oh, I'm uh, sorry. Sorry. Isaac is keeping with the French theme reading The Little Prince by Antoine de Saint-Exupéry. This is a very well-known children's classic about a pilot stranded in a desert who then meets the little prince and listens to his stories. I couldn't for the life of me find the correct edition. Magic apple juice strikes again, en français. Why didn't Elle have anything to drink with her breakfast anyway? Surely she saw the apple juices herself. I wanted to share a bed with you. Same. Do you think they coordinated these matching t-shirts on purpose together while packing? Quote from costume designer Adam D. Nick was very sporty last year, and Charlie had his vintage and his stripes, so they've started to influence each other. And obviously, Charlie's stealing way more of Nick's clothes this year, like his jumpers. Nick and Charlie wear these outfits, except Nick's wearing jeans in the promo shoots. I'm sure we'll get to do it one day. I didn't mean, I, I didn't mean to do it. I, I was just talking about, you know, sharing a bed, that's all. I <sighs> came out wrong. I know what you meant. I can't wait. Wait, which one do you mean? Also, yep, you'll definitely be doing stuff next season. Yeah. 
It's so funny how in the trailer they made it seem like this was a sad scene, but it ended up just being them being awkward about an accidental innuendo. Everything's gonna be perfect. You're coming up. Oh, you're being gay. Good job. Carry on. So this moment was iconic in the comics. And to demonstrate just how iconic, here's a clip from the season two trailer reaction video I did. They knew that was the one that we wanted. Yeah, they knew that was the scene that we had to have in the trailer. Oh, hell yeah. Okay, gang, today you get to explore Montmartre. Montmartre is a big steep hill, so if you go, be prepared to climb so many stairs. I just about died. These pictures are shit because I took them. <laughs> it's a famous historical place where lots of bohemian artists used to live and work. Hi. Meet back here by the coach at 5pm, please. And please don't get lost. I'm looking at you. <laughs> That's so funny because they're both Truham teachers, so they didn't know Darcy before this trip and they already clocked she's the one who would get lost. They're not wrong. <laughs> I always feel like Paris helped as well. Because obviously we did oh we did our like beefy scenes as such after Paris, so we had that whole week of literally twenty four hours of Basically, yeah, yeah, yeah. together. So it was like after that and then we knew we knew we were friends, so we were able to do it. it. Made the bigger scenes easier for us. Yeah, definitely. Look, Jordan, who's with me? <laughs> <laughs> we should get one of those padlocks and write our initials on it. You're joking. So lame. I need a drink. An alcoholic drink. Probably shouldn't drink alcohol. I need a crossing then. Croissant! Come on. What's the plan? The what about the museum? Let's talk about these costumes. The promo slash poster shoot features mostly costumes from this episode. Isaac is wearing a sweater vest in the colours of the Arrow Ace flag. He's not reading Pride and Prejudice like in the poster though, he read that in season 1 episode 5. Elle is wearing her episode 4 outfit in the promo shoots, but Tao wears his clothes from episode 5. Sahar is wearing her outfit from the Heartstopper yearbook and the casting call. Quote from articles, study up on 25 Heartstopper season 2 easter eggs and fun facts by Tara Bitcher and Fontudu. Costume designer Adam D. recalled an image in the comics that was used in the casting call for Sahar, one in which the character sports a little orange jumper and checked trousers. So with Alice, we're like, let's try to get that in. Like Sahar's whole personality, it's so very like, I don't care what people think about me. If I like something, I'm going to wear it. And that's what she does. She loves a bit of... We saw a lot of double denim in season two. I don't know. Yeah, so like denim crop jackets and jeans and like funky tops. Sahar's fashion sense is probably a lot better than mine because all I do is wear tracksuits and trainers. <laughs> I am like, you would never catch me in anything else except like, if I wear a pair of jeans, I think that's dressing up. Um, so yeah, I mean, I'm all about comfort and Sahar's probably like comfort but look cool and I don't look cool ever. That's probably why no one ever sees me like in London or whatever because I just blend in. I've just got my like, hoodie on and my trainers and I'm like, walking through <laughs> central London looking like a tramp, basically. My style is um, tramp. Sahar's is rock. <laughs> I'm not on her level at all. I wish I could be, but it's just not in me. I like a tracksuit too much.
I think research-wise, you're really lucky with Heartstopper that the graphic novels exist, kind of like a, a visual representation of some of the work. And obviously there's a lot of fan art out there. There's quite a big fan base who draw and recreate a lot of the images from the, the graphic novels. So although you're not completely copying it, there is this kind of, you know, you have to kind of honour that artwork. And it, But it's a really good place to start from, you know, and then looking at kind of Gen Z fashions and, and, and what people from that age group are kind of wearing day to day. You know, there's like, you can look on social media and things and there's a lot of kind of real life images of, of what people are wearing so that's that's quite useful um i think and um yeah just looking online on on shopping websites and um fashion articles and just getting a really good idea of what might help 2d drawings in the books to something kind of 3d there's that element that we all do when you go on holiday you curate your best outfits and you just want to look amazing and yeah. obviously characters like l and imogen of maybe going to go for that more than someone like Charlie, who might just be more comfortable in just what he wears. That's just right. him. When we started the season and you kind of look at where their all personal growth is with Eros at one point, we'd sort of said that that, that experience in Paris has to grow them slightly. And so the coach journey there and the coach journey back were kind of like these bookends um, to that and, and what happens after Paris and how they appear older at the queer exhibition. So I think throughout Paris, you had to see that exploration of each of their styles a bit more to kind of get to that point. Apparently just getting the costumes to Paris was a whole ordeal. The main cast's costumes were transported in seven large wardrobe boxes and six full suitcases. I don't know, I think museums are kind of boring. Yeah, it'd be nice to just explore. That's some calculated nonchalance. When Moi painted that. True, he painted this in and off the garden while living there. Why don't you two go together then? We can meet you in a couple of hours. Just us? Sure. Okay, now you guys kiss! <laughs> you see? No big deal! Have fun. Take this! Yeah, have a good right. time, see you soon. Bye. What's been your favourite moment of season two? I love that there's been like way more scenes of all of us together this year yeah now that i think about it, like when we were staying in paris for that week it was that was so much nice fun. we were all on the we were same so exhausted <laughs> but it was it was great yeah i feel like we've all gotten so close this year even closer than last year did way you more close like we were yeah. all really close last year but i think we're all still a bit like shy and scared of everything i think we've all fit in so well so well that you couldn't at least yeah. you don't know how you've done it it must have been so daunting i was freaked out i was like so nervous i remember i was thinking these people already know each other they all got their friendships already like how are we gonna slide into this but it was nice coming in with nima and jack and bradley quote from costume designer adam d you see Darcy wearing an I Love Paris sweatshirt because in the graphic novels, there's a scene where she goes and buys this hoodie. I think these references are very important for the fan base because they're so familiar with it and recognize them immediately. For some people, there's this idea of how you should dress, but Darcy is happy being in a pair of boys' shorts and a hoodie. She's just happy being herself and doesn't care much about style beyond that. I think that's quite an important part of her character. And I think with everyone, we really ramped up the color in the costumes for Paris to symbolize them opening up into this bigger world. Previously, we're always in school or little local hangouts. And then they enter this wider, more magical experience. And their clothes really reflect that shift. This card is the one Charlie sends to Tori as seen on the back of Heartstopper Volume 3. Quote from articles, study up on 25 Heartstopper Season 2 Easter eggs and fun facts by Tara Bitsch and Fortudum. The art department also had a Paris map made to match the one on the cover. What's more, they printed postcards that resembled one of Charlie's from the back cover of the book and snuck them into the background of sets, like the hotel where the gang stays. And we wrote Charlie's writing tutorials in the back of the book, Beard added. I hope fans will slyly spot little nuggets like that. Quote from production designer Karis Beard. 
The souvenir shop was really fun. For the merchandise we had there, we used Alice's style of drawings and drew some Paris locations that we printed onto merchandise to send to the shop to be used as props alongside the store's real merchandise. So even those elements are in our world, and we had our characters buy them in the scene. It's nice that we get a chance to hang out outside the library for once. Yeah, it's nice just uh, to be around all the gay people. Quote from Bradley Riches. Reading the comics, I concluded James was gay, but he had a lot of internalized homophobia because I feel like he wants to kiss Charlie, but he's acting cool. That's been totally scrapped, and James is an openly gay character. I think it's what James always wanted in the comics. Oui, monsieur. Est-ce que je pourrais avoir deux bulles de glace au chocolat, s'il vous plaît? Ah oui, oui, bien sûr. Mais attendez, vous êtes anglais? Alors déjà pour le casting, il y en a beaucoup qui me demandaient ouais, mais comment t'as réussi à faire le casting, etc. Mais écoutez, c'est simple en fait. Je suis inscrit sur tellement de groupes Facebook de casting, c'est un truc de dingue. Et par bonheur, ça fait maintenant quasiment allez une petite dizaine d'années quoi que que j'essaye de faire des castings. Donc maintenant. Il bah, y a des gens qui se souviennent de moi parce que j'ai envoyé ma tête tellement de fois, j'ai envoyé ma bande démo tellement de fois que les gars ils disent « Eh, il y a binge ?» Mais en tout cas, cette annonce-là, c'était sur un groupe Facebook de casting. Euh, j'ai dû remplir un Google Form, franchement aléatoire, et il ne marquait absolument pas que c'était pour Heartstopper. Il marquait juste que c'était pour, euh, pour une plateforme de streaming. Tu passes le casting avec une scène dont les acteurs, enfin en tout cas le, le nom des comédiens, etc. n'est pas mis, ni leur nom de personnage. Comme ça, tu es brouillé, tu es dans le foot, tu ne sais pas ce qui se passe. Tu passes l'essai et t'attends, 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 t'attends. Jusqu'au jour où il y a ce bon vieux Loïc qui dit « Ouais, ben, je... ben écoute, ben voilà, ben t'es pris, bravo. » Mais encore là, on ne me dit même pas ce que c'est. Là, c'était sous un nom fictif. Alors, je sais pas si j'ai le droit de donner le nom. Il y a raison de contrat, tout ça, machin. Mais en tout cas, même jusqu'au jour du tournage, je ne savais pas pourquoi j'allais tourner. Le seul truc un peu classe quand même, c'est que euh, avant ça, j'avais reçu des mails Netflix. Là, c'était pas pour euh, payer l'abonnement, tout ça. Non, 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 non. Là, c'était en mode. Oui, mais écoutez, Monsieur Benjamin, vous êtes convoqué à 9 h pour jouer un petit glacier. Donc c'est plutôt sympa. Ça. Ces petits mails là, ils sont plutôt cool. <rire> Arrive le jour du tournage et puis là forcément bah là je vois les comédiens etc mais j'avoue j'avoue my bad sorry guys je ne connaissais pas la série avant du coup j'ai appris à connaître la série franchement plutôt pas mal pas mal du tout on a tourné cette petite scène donc vous voyez la scène elle dure vraiment pas longtemps on a tourné sur une petite journée allez une matinée et alors là tous les acteurs les actrices des crèmes absolues sincèrement d'une gentillesse folle même Kit avant de de, de parler français etc m'a demandé il m'a fait des tests pour savoir si quand même ça allait et tout. Oh, j'ai pas fait le chien, j'ai dit que oui aussi, voilà, c'est tout, c'est tout. Mais en tout cas, voilà, ça a duré une demi-journée, c'était exceptionnel. Comme première expérience sur Netflix, mais je suis plutôt content, ouais, j'avoue, j'avoue. Bonjour. Bonjour. Bonjour, mon ami. Today we're at this beautiful ice cream truck and we're going to make a TV show. We're going to buy some ice cream. Yeah, bubble gum for me. Maybe someone speaks French. <laughs> Merci beaucoup. Merci beaucoup. Oui, je suis en voyage scolaire. C'est dingue, vous n'avez pas d'accent, c'est fou. Bravo, bravo. Ah, merci. Quote from Kit Connor. In the script, they originally said, Oh, are you English? Your accent is perfect. And that was in my nightmares. The French fans of Heartstopper are going to see that and go, at least if it was a little bit off, they could go, Yeah, but he's English. But if they say that my accent is perfect, then it would be rough. Luckily, when I watched the show, I saw they changed that line to, Your accent is very good. So that suddenly made me feel a lot better about my accent. Let's not tell him that it's only the English subtitles and the French line is still you have no accent. Par bonheur, j'ai réussi à décrocher un petit rôle dans une série Netflix et depuis, une vague de haine, ça va sur moi. <rire> voilà, je joue le glacier dans la série Heartstopper. Et on me dit, mais comment oses-tu dire qu'il n'a pas d'accent alors que clairement, on entend qu'il a un petit accent. C'est vrai, c'est vrai C'est un mensonge, j'assume totalement. Mais un petit mensonge comme ça, le gars était heureux. Que demande le peuple What is demanding the people I don't know. I don't know. Donc voilà, 
Franchement. Ouais, c'est peut-être vrai aussi que c'était marqué comme ça dans le scénario. Et il dit, bon, bah, qu'est-ce que tu veux Quand t'es comédien, faut faire le scénario, et puis c'est tout Excusez-moi, je me suis emporté, mais c'est parce que là, euh, j'en peux plus, quoi. J'en peux plus. Ouais, non, je déconne, et non, c'est que de l'amour, c'est que du love, euh, comme dirait Patrick Sébastien. A tout dit quanti, el muchachos. Um, since when could you speak French, like an actual French person Okay, it is a bit weird they gave this line to Sahar. She hasn't known him long at all, and she certainly doesn't know him well. It would have made more sense for Darcy to say this. Oh, my dad's French. Since when? Since his birth? <laughs> I love this bit so much because Nick is so perplexed and just doesn't understand why this is a whole thing for everyone. To him, it's just casual, whatever. <laughs> How are things between you and Nick? Really good. It's great being in Paris. Um, it's so fun. Yesterday we went to Disneyland. Shh, don't tell production. But I'm gonna go film my scene now, so pee. I mean, we were shooting at the Sakaka and we saw sunrise the other, the other day. It was literally one of the most beautiful things I've ever seen. Um, I think Paris is a gorgeous, gorgeous city. Yeah. Um, and to be able to shoot there and, you know, having certain locations in Paris was like, you know, insane. And it was a sort of pinch me moment for the whole cast and the production because it felt like, you know, after season one was so small and, and it still feels like a, a very small show for us, but to be there on our little show um, in Paris was, was pretty crazy. Yeah, I echo everything Kate said. Yeah. Why does it, does it look like we're not okay? It looks like Nick is so in love with you. It's a bit unbearable to watch sometimes. Agree on the Hard Eyes Nelson statement, but I think all of these stats prove a few people might disagree on the unbearable to watch part. I suppose I'm sort of jealous of you and Darcy. You're out and you can hold hands and kiss and... I really want that, but I don't want Nick to get bullied like I was. It took ages for me to even feel comfortable calling myself a lesbian. Quote from Kizzy Edgel. I think it's really important to say that word, lesbian, because you sometimes hear celebrities say, oh, I don't use that word, it's ugly. It's completely out of line. What a damaging thing to say. I like the word lesbian. I like that Darcy and Tara are overt about it. And I like Darcy's unashamedness. Quote from Corina Brown. Yeah, I like that Darcy pulls Tara out of her shell. You're a lesbian. It's fine. We're all okay. It's great because it's like you have lesbians in the real world. We're able to represent people who don't feel seen. And I get to work with Kizzy every day, so it's great. Yeah, I feel, I feel the same. I think I just feel genuinely lucky to, to get to do this and like honoured and, and grateful. And we were so scared of what people might say at school, so we didn't tell anyone about us for months. But eventually, we stopped caring about all those people. We just realised. Ten minutes? What are you all doing still outside? You're going to be great. And even if you're not great, I'll still think you're great because I always think you're great. Oh, right at me. <laughs> <laughs>
Thank you, kind sir. Oh, Here she my is. Here yeah, she is. <laughs> oh. <laughs> you got some junk. Huh? I got some junk in my truck. <laughs> Fun fact, both Corina and Alice have experience in ballet. I was put into dance by my mum mm. when I was like two. Mainly because I was like clumsy little kid. Um, I used to fall over, break all her stuff. She weren't having that. She was like, go do ballet, learn to be graceful. Um, <laughs> I loved dance, fell in love with it from there. Wasn't much like, wasn't very graceful, still clumsy. Um, but that's, yeah, where I fell in love with that. Did ballet, tap, jazz, street dance, cheerleading. So my mum is Trudy Oseman. She is one of the directors of a community dance school called the Bluebell School of Dance. It's been her life's passion and she teaches ballet. And so obviously I did ballet growing up. <laughs> 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 of, course. of course. And was that from a really young age where you were tiny bumhead? Yes. I, I think I must have been two um, <gasps> when I started, you know, baby ballet. <laughs> How long did that continue? I did it all the way until I was 14. And I'll clap really loud even if you fall over and mess up the entire thing. Me and her were all that mattered. I'm a little confused about the timeline with this flashback. They're kind of kissing in public, but no one's seeing them right now. But this is supposed to exemplify them being confident as a couple, and it's snowing outside, so it's last winter. But they came out after Harry's birthday, which was on March 20th. So I doubt it would snow in Kent after that. Though maybe it's not that deep, and they could have just been like this in the winter, even before they were out. I'm jealous of you and Nick in some ways, too. What? Why? You both talk about your feelings. This line kind of implies she's had some conversations with Nick and or Charlie about their relationship that we have not seen because it's not like she's witnessed that firsthand. I just find it sweet to imagine her and Nick talking about their relationships and sharing their love stories with each other. Darcy just makes everything into a joke. It's hard to get to open up. I said I love you to her last week and she didn't say it back. This will actually be pretty relevant for season 4 when Charlie starts having fears that Nick doesn't reciprocate the love he feels or isn't ready to say it back if Charlie says it first. The Tara Darcy I love you plotline is new to the show, it's not from the comics, and creates a new parallel between the couples for their love confession journeys. Ship, so I had to get a strawberry. Shall we go and sit down there? It's a better view. Can we throw them? Yeah! No. No. Don't make a mess! <laughs> <laughs> Can we drop them? The rest of the day. <laughs> Emma.
I'm still full from breakfast. Sorry, you didn't eat that much breakfast. Yeah, I did. <laughs> Chocolate, not bubble gum. It's not bad. But I'm lactose intolerant, so it's not good. <laughs> you, you've got some on your nose. Oh. Let me get that. A little bit more. I think we don't have to talk about it. It wasn't this pretty when I went there two months after they filmed this. I agree with what you said. Things were better when we were just friends. I... Yeah. I'm happy you're making new friends, but I just get in my head about being left behind and alone. Our friendship is really important to me. Me too. I don't want to stop being friends. Shall we uh, go look at some art now? I've always played yeah. the part of Shakespeare. Okay. Tired of being a book on the shelf. Elle, for instance, at the beginning of season one, she is more, I don't know, trying to hide a little bit when she first starts at the new school, like not trying to sort of say too much about herself and then obviously as she gets stronger in herself and her character and she meets the lesbians Tara and Darcy she grows and grows so then by this point before Paris she's had the interview to go to the Lambert school yeah so she meets all these characters that maybe she feels she fits in with more who are more expressive about themselves so like then when she goes to Paris she's got this love for 1970s and vintage clothing and she's like right I'm taking all of that with me and I'm going to put my best clothes on I wanna ah! be ah! Alice said on their Tumblr, Chronic Introvert, and Twitter, or X, that this whole museum montage was improvised by William and Yasmin. We're in a public space. Yeah. You can take this at your house. Ah! Oh, oui. Okay. This lady went in with this principle. I am not being racist, but whenever I go back to the UK, I will always ask an Asian person to help me take the photo. And that is because they are better picture takers than us Brits, and they put in much more effort. But she landed on a British Asian guy, so she got the effort, but with questionable results. We're in Paris and it started to rain so we had to postpone filming. It's kind of beautiful. I like it. I like the rain. <laughs> Nini and Riri gonna be on the TV. BTS. How did it go? Fine. Or we could do some shopping. <laughs> oh, what's going on there? Oh, wow, wow, wow! We'll go to the museum. It's so fitting that everyone else is wearing all these fun, colourful clothes and Ben sticks out in his bland grey, perfectly embodying how soulless and repressed he is. Get off! What? I'm so glad Imogen doesn't tolerate that performative macho-possessive bullshit. 
She's very young with very little relationship experience and it's easy to just get stuck being treated badly when you don't know better yet. There's a strength to her. Hey guys. You know what? We all want to go to Paris. Get, get Imogen to Paris. I would love more than anything that Imogen to go to Paris and like just sort of rock up in like a beret and like red lipstick and like shopping bags and be like bonjour and like refuse to speak any other language other than the French or something. That's something we did definitely with Imogen. Mm. Like we saw a lot of tourists actually walking around Paris kind of dressing that experience. Right. And I think that really worked with Imogen. It's like he doesn't even want to hang out with me anymore now that we're dating. Bon des Arts is a bridge that is famous for having lots of love locks. The idea is to write your and your significant other's initials on the lock, attach it to the bridge and throw away the key as a symbol of your undying commitment. The locks get routinely cut off to prevent damage to the bridge. We return here in episode 5. All he cares about is having a girlfriend. And then that was really eye-opening as well. It's like, like, I knew the show was massive, like all my friends were talking about it. But it was like going to Paris and then seeing like these like, it felt like thousands, it probably wasn't thousands, but like thousands of people like watching us film like yeah. a scene and like waiting for people to meet them. And it was just like, oh my God, I'm a part of something massive. And it was, it was really nice while we were shooting as well to have uh, like, probably for the Netflix guys, it wasn't great for spoilers, but for us it was like, yeah really nice to have that immediate kind of support of people that were interested in, in what we were making. Yeah. It felt more like doing theatre because there was Club a lot of there. <laughs> Club, yeah, yeah, it was really cute. Quote from director A. Roslin. When we shot season one, people would walk past in the street and nobody would know them from Adam. But season two, that's not the case. We were shooting scenes in the middle of Paris with actors and costumes that we didn't really want to show the world, but it's impossible. There are Heartstopper fans everywhere. The minute we started shooting, there were pictures being posted online and there was great excitement. So you sort of have to go, you know what, that's fine. There are fans who love the show so much that this is a huge highlight to get to see a scene being filmed. You have to kind of embrace it. And when we were filming on like in Paris, on the streets of Paris, they'd like block 
off those streets so that you can walk on them and stuff and you've got loads of people just filming you and you're like <laughs> really distracted but you kind of get on with it because that's the job um yeah just really cool just really cool and even yeah just mental and now he just ignores me all the time i'm not even sure he likes me that much do you even like him good question that he sounds horrible Um, when we meet Imogen in season two, I think she is even more uncertain of herself in many ways. And, you know, she she's changing up her her friends, her relationships, you know, her, her clothes in Paris, um, even her hair. You'll notice that I don't have the bleach blonde streaks. Um, so she's on a massive journey of self-discovery in, in a very similar way to the other characters. I thought maybe you and Tao. No, not gonna happen. Am I fine just being friends? Sure, sure. Convince yourself harder. Maybe I haven't had the best track record of relationships, <laughs> but I think being honest is better than living with regret. <laughs> I was thinking a lot about when there's like walking scenes. There's a lot of scenes in Paris where we're just walking along. And in a lot of those takes, we're just, we're just having fun. Having fun. Yeah. Um, Will was doing silly walks. I think they kept that in there, didn't they? Yeah. The exterior of the restaurant is L'Escalier in Bout Montmartre. It actually looks quite different on the inside than the stand in restaurant they use for the interior shoot. <laughs> The restaurant scenes were shot in Levan, London, in Peckham. Production added all the framed pictures on the walls. Ben doesn't just sit there to be a nuisance. Imogen already sat down, so he's sitting opposite her. So as much as it seems like it, this might not actually be a calculated move. Quote from DOP Simona Shushna. We brought a lot of elements of Paris into our London set builds where the art department built the hotel rooms. The interior of the restaurant where the kids have dinner in Paris was also an interior in London. So little bits like that we could just cheat with because there was literally no time. And I think we were really successful because I don't think you can see the joins. Je suis intolérant à l'oignon et la haine. I'm serious, big man, I get bloated, it's not fun. Escargot? Oh, merci. Yes! Towel! Are you okay? Can you breathe? Have another dig. You can have more than Jay. Go on. It's all the way in there. It's all the way in there. It's a snail. You're not inclined to have another dig then. I haven't spoken to you in ages. Maybe there might be a reason for that if you think really hard. How's your first day in Paris? Saha is not enjoying her meal. I would be disappointed too if I'd ordered this, to be honest. I'm not interested in how my day was then. Alice was asked on her Tumblr, Chronic Introvert, what Nick would have done if Imogen didn't interrupt him getting out of his seat just then. Their answer was, I think that Nick would have just asked Charlie to swap seats with him and then quietly told Ben to stay the fuck away from Charlie. Nick wouldn't have caused a big scene in front of everyone because he wouldn't want to cause Charlie any anxiety or upset, as much as he probably just wanted to punch Ben in the face. Why are you in the mood with me? Because you're supposed to be my boyfriend! But instead you've got some sort of obsession with Charlie. What are you trying to say? 
What are you trying to say? <laughs> I don't know why you're obsessed with Charlie. Yeah, maybe don't just throw that on the table in front of everyone when you have no idea what's going on, but you can clearly see he's making Charlie uncomfortable, and you had a cryptic warning from Nick before that was clearly serious enough that he couldn't tell you but felt it was important. Not the best move. All I know is you're a terrible boyfriend, and I deserve better. I'm breaking up with you. This guy's living for the drama. Your energy's off! You're not mature and clearly you have some- I don't know why you're obsessed with Charlie. All I know is you're a terrible boyfriend. I've got a boyfriend. He ignores me sometimes. He pretends like I doesn't know who I am. I thought you had a boyfriend. No, no, he was horrible. This is someone else. There's a boy in there waiting for you. Right. Is it their secret boyfriend or the straight boy crush? He's on the rugby team. I joined the rugby team. And I'm not gonna wait around for you. I think it's time I focus on myself. If you don't want to be with me anymore, that's fine. You don't have to be such a bitch about it. Uh, Benjamin, language. Oh, he's got a point, man. Pipe down. There's no need to call her a bitch. Don't call her a bitch. Yeah, it's not cool. So... <laughs> Everyone watching this, including me of course, was so shocked that Harry was the voice of reason. Some people didn't understand how that even happened, but Imogen has been friends with Harry for a long time, so it makes sense he would not approve, especially since there's no way to think of Ben's comeback as funny, even to Harry. <laughs> The book Harry Just Tried to Snatch is Kate Chopin's The Awakening, a feminist classic from 1899 about a young mother's struggle to achieve sexual and personal emancipation in the oppressive environment of the postbellum American South. I think Isaac having a feminist book in this particular scene is a little nod to Imogen standing up for herself. I don't know, maybe I shouldn't have done that in front of everyone. Well, at least you made this guy's day. The actor is Ross Rankin, by the way. Well, I think it was one of the coolest things I've ever seen, so... <laughs> Agreed. Did you and Ben ever? It doesn't matter. Ugh, everything would be so much easier if I was into girls. Uh... <laughs> not so sure about that, but um, I know what you mean. Yet another classic, over-enthusiastic, slightly clueless ally girl thing to say. Ally! <laughs> Could I maybe have a hug? Do you think she's a character in some ways has been maybe a little understood in the first season? Are you hoping to maybe kind of reframe re people's understanding of who Imogen is? Yeah, I mean, it was such an interesting reaction. Like, she's, she's definitely uh, on the more morally grey side of things. Um, but I think we have two sides of her. She's a very vulnerable person. And at the same time, there's also that um, sort of quite confident, bolsterous facade that she puts up. And I think people can see that or, um, without looking at the vulnerability. And I think if you have a look at the vulnerability, we see a very different type of person that people like initially react to. Nick gets Charlie's approval first. He had some weird history with Imogen after all. How'd it go with Elle today? It was fine. We just walked around the museum for a bit. It was nice. Well, I always thought you two would be good together, so. Yes, we all know you're the number one towel shipper here. You don't get it. Elle is literally the most amazing person in the world. She's gone through so much shit. I was her friend when she came out as a trans and that was not a fun time for her. Why would she ever like me anyway? She liked you first! She's so cool and interesting and beautiful and... I'm just me, you know. I think you're pretty cool too. And interesting. But not beautiful. <laughs> Isaac is reading We Are Okay by Nina Lacour again. We already saw him with this book in episode 2. This is the first time we see him return to a book. Either he must have loved it or got stuck and came back to it after a break. Been there. Well, 
You're a good looking guy, if that's what you're worried about. That's so funny because in real life, Kit is like. Will's really cool, annoyingly. He's really cool. He's like, he looks cool, he dresses well. Yeah. He's just, this is basically, this This has just become our sort of our crushing right. over, yeah. over Will Gow, but I think it's fair. I would say the first friend that I made on set was uh, the gorgeous Mr. William Gow, who is actually my husband. Congrats, yeah. by the way. Sorry, yeah. I couldn't make it. Uh, whatever. And that's not even all the examples I could include here, but I think I made my point clear. I thought you didn't even like me. I think this is an unconscious defense in Tao's mind. He's still clinging onto this idea of a rivalry between himself and Nick that isn't there, rather than allowing himself to be vulnerable and accept Nick's attempts at bonding. This conversation is the first time he's starting to let Nick in. The more Tao lets people in, the more risk there is that he will get hurt. I feel for him because I'm like this too. In a way, it's easier to just assume people dislike you automatically rather than have false hope that they like you. I do like you, Tal. You're funny. You care about your friends so loudly without worrying what anyone else might think, and that's... Well, that's, that's really cool. Uh, I'm gonna go get something from the vending machine. Isaac, you coming? Yeah, sure. If I were Isaac, I would have been riveted listening in on that juicy conversation. So, first of all, that bottom row of pictures from the Louvre shouldn't exist yet. Second of all, what's going on here? <laughs> Well, that is definitely Kit Connor, not Nick Nelson. Because, well, I mean, need I say more? <laughs> Did you just post another photo of me on Instagram? I see Charlie has mixed post notifications on. <laughs> oh, <okay. laughs> Hi. Hi. <laughs> I saw this tweet once that I can't find anymore where a neurodivergent guy was baffled by why his girlfriend would do this, as in say hi when you're lying down together staring into each other's eyes like this. Someone explained it to him something like, You've entered a different state of intimacy, so entering into that private realm with you warrants a new greeting because it's a different interaction than you had before when you were just casually chatting. I thought it was a lovely explanation because I never questioned it, but that feels so spot on to me. You seem kind of down today. I just wanted to be alone with you. I'm sure that would help, but it's clearly not just that. You taste like toothpaste. Like the first time we kissed at your house. <laughs> but I literally just have brushed my teeth, so... So... Uh... Is that okay? Yeah. <laughs> For almost the whole first week season 2 was out, there was an error in this scene. They forgot to replace the temporary music track, so the scene sounded like this. Quote from composer Arieska Chase. One of the pieces that I was most excited about doing was when Nick and Charlie are in the hotel room together and they're playing around, but they get more intimate. This is not a show about sex. This is not a show about getting raunchy. It's about revealing different sides to yourself. If you have a partner, bit by bit, you break down certain walls and you learn more about each other. And that's beautiful, even when it does become more sexual. What Nick and Charlie have isn't raunchy, but it's more grown up. And I wanted the music to feel more grown up. 
Usually when I write music, I sit down and I've got all my instruments up on my computer, I've got instruments around me, and I start playing and producing as I go. But with this one, I got my keyboard out and I just played some chords. They're quite mature, just nice chords. Then I went into my synthesizer and I tried it in some different sounds. There's this warm synth that kind of evolves as you let the note play out, and then I added effects and things as well. The chord progression is the heart of the piece, but then the stuff around it is flipping around and evolving. It's warm, but it's expanding. Some of it I specifically did out of time because when you are doing that sort of stuff, no one knows what they're doing. It's not perfect, but there's beauty in imperfection. There's a beauty in feeling a bit embarrassed or a bit worried that things aren't going to be beautiful and amazing. But you're not worried. You're just in that moment. The piece just feels very natural, even though it's made up of all these synths. I get very passionate talking about that piece. It really does mean a lot. Knowing how this new piece of music was so exciting for the composer just makes it so sad that so many people who watched season 2 just once when it came out didn't even hear it. I'm pretty sure this is also the track she's talking about when asked to pick her favourite from season 2 in this interview. Oh, it's so hard to pick a favourite from season 2. There's one particular track where it's very new and it represents Nick and Charlie growing up basically and uh, how their relationship develops and it's a very specific moment to that. In season one you very much see the sort of the, the young love and the sort of beginnings of their relationship and I think that it would be lovely, you know, not just to act but also just to see as well their relationship just sort of get stronger and blossom. Heartstopper very much follows the blossoming relationship that we see. You see it right at the very beginning. Yeah, I think they sort of, their, their relationships like, you know, starts to blossom and they get more comfortable with each other. Obviously Nick and Charlie's relationship kind of blossoms. And I've been using the word blossom. I think a relationships blossom, the storyline kind of blossoms, yeah, everything gets blossomed. Quote from Intimacy Coordinator David Thackeray on choreographing this scene. Of course, for me, the whole thing was, how can we make that motion believable so that we're not questioning, what's he doing there? What's happening there? Is he just snuggling into the neck? Is there a motion that we need to find? It is a little bit more technical, like, okay, maybe if you just move the head a little bit in this shot, or add a little bit of tension. But what sells that moment as well is Charlie's reaction to the hickey, especially the reaction in the mirror of seeing it. And then, Tao's reaction is just the best. Nick, we, we should stop. We're gonna get caught. Uh, yeah, yeah. I think you lost the challenge. Ah. <laughs> Charlie, that was just blatant sabotage from you. This is the closest we'll ever get to someone saying fuck on Heartstopper on Netflix. They got away with piss in the first season and shit and dick multiple times this season, but using the F word would give the show an automatic higher age rating and thus decrease its reach potential. That's it for episode 4! Subscribe for more Paris adventures next week!